but most of us have had some association with the zoo in Adelaide and at Monato over some period of time, both as younger people and with our children and with our grandchildren. And it's a very emotional part of our life as we grow up. But most people are not aware that Adelaide is Australia's second oldest zoo and commenced in 1883. I assume that Taronga Park in Sydney is the oldest. Melbourne is the oldest. I've been corrected. That's good. The, the other thing that um, we should also be aware of is that zoo S, the zoos in SA are unique in Australia. The other Australian zoos are government entities and financed by their state governments. In South Australia, the government funding grant that Zoos SA get is about 22% of its overall revenue. So there's an enormous differential between the zoos around Australia and the zoos in South Australia. In 2012, Zoos SA, in a very well publicised amount of media, was in serious financial trouble. And I think most of us would rem remember that. And at the time, Elaine, who was a self-proclaimed animal lover and conservationist, and not as well publicised as could have been, but as in the notes that she gr had great influence in the financial sector and as banking, and had actually had great educational backgrounds, she took a great chance, a great chance, and showed great courage Please welcome Elaine Benstead, CEO of Zoos SA. Thank you so much for that introduction, Jeff, and very kind words. Um, you know, I was the chief executive of TAFE, and that was, you know, not an easy gig either. And this one is so much more fun. Uh, and not only that, although we don't get quite as much government money, I don't report to a minister. And I've got to say, that's quite pleasant. I report to a board who are all very passionate about what we do. So, uh, look, thanks for the opportunity to come and present to you for a second time. I actually was here about three years ago at a time when we had just launched our master plan. So it's nice to come back and give you a little bit of an update. Um, can I first of all thank the Adelaide Oval Stadium Management um, Hospitality Group for our lovely lunch. Uh, they're also our catering partners at Monato, so they look after all of our visitors at Monato, so I always like to give them, a, give them a bit of a plug. So, as you've heard, I always like to remind people that we are a little bit unique in, in Australia in that we are established as a charity, um, legally incorporated under the Associations Act. So officially we are owned by Zoos SA members. We do receive some government money, and for that I'm very, very thankful. Uh, as you've heard, it's not quite as much as some of our interstate counterparts uh, receive. However, we also have a lot more freedom because we don't have to comply with a whole lot of, of government rules. So we run both Adelaide and Monato, uh, and we're very lucky to have two quite unique and different sites that allows us to do a lot of things that we wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And our reason for being is, is very simple to say, but not so easy to achieve. And you heard a little bit about some of the challenges that um, many species are fa facing. So our mission is about connecting people with nature and saving species from extinction. And everything we do always comes back to that particular purpose. Is it going to help us connect more people? And is it going to help save more species? And we've developed a really robust strategic plan, and I'm sort of using these as much as my talking point reminders because I understand some at the back may not be able to read the detail. But our strategic plan and our business plan is based around four goals. And the first two are really directly tied to our mission. It's about connecting people with nature. It's about saving species from extinction. The second two are more about us as an organisation and how we operate. So goal three is about working ethically and sustainably. And for us that's really important because we are often trying to encourage our visitors 
to change behaviour, whether that's uh, to donate to wonderful causes to try and save rhinos from extinction, whether it's about the use of sustainable palm oil, uh, whether it's about trying to get rid of single-use plastics or balloons that end up as marine pollution. There's a whole range of things that we're trying to encourage our visitors and the community to do. So we really have to look inside at our own operations and say, how good are we at that ourselves? Our use of energy, our use of water, Zoos, I know at home I hate getting my electricity bill, but at work I really hate getting an electricity bill um, because running zoos is incredibly power hungry. Um, so looking at how we can improve our use of sustainables, we now get about 30% of our power from uh, solar, uh, which is fabulous, looking at our use of water, etc. And goal four is about ourselves as a business. Um, running a sound business. I think everybody in South Australia knows that the zoo um, hadn't necessarily always run as a sound business and for me it was probably quite lucky that in 2012 when I, when I um, applied for the role the board were looking for someone not necessarily from an animal background and that had been a unique thing because the zoo generally hadn't had people and most zoos around the world have veterinarians or biologists, conservationists, um, and that wasn't my background at all. And that was because in our 140 year history, the animal bit generally runs pretty well. But the business bit, hmm, not quite so much. And not just in a financial sense, but in a risk management, in our management of our people, management of our critical volunteers. So. We've sort of structured our business around those four goals and we've got fairly detailed action plans for each of those. But at the, sorry, so we'll give, you won't see the numbers here, I said it's as much to remind me. When I started in 2012, you know, the zoo had been operating, as you heard, since actually the society was formed in 1878 and it opened the doors to the public in 1883. And yet when I started, the zoo didn't have a strategic plan. And nobody at the zoo would ever really question that because zoos were places you held animals. You don't need any of that business stuff. So there wasn't a strategic plan, there wasn't a business plan, there wasn't a lot of oversight of finances, there wasn't a marketing plan. I think for about the first six months, everything I asked to see, I think staff got quite sick of me, um, the answer was, oh, we don't have one of those. So it was like, can I see our risk management? We don't have one of those. Now, it didn't mean that the zoo hadn't been managing risks, because running zoos, there are lots of risks. And they'd been managing them, but it wasn't written down, because that's not what zoos did. Um, marketing, they'd obviously been doing marketing. You know, we've been engaging visitors for 135 years, but was there a structured marketing plan or a social media plan? So we developed a strategic plan in 2012 and that meant that five years later um, in June 2017 we, we took the opportunity to do a review of just where we've come from in that five years and this was a really quick snapshot of where we've come from and when I look at the finances and there's probably a few people who are interested in numbers here I did start working in a, in a banking sector um, we've been able to turn the business around so we had actually been operating in deficit for about 11 years um, we did that, it's nothing rocket science, it's the same as any business when you're trying to turn it around. We pretty much maintained our expenditure at the same level five years on, which of course in real terms is a significant reduction, but we kept a really tight lid on expenditure. We increased our revenue, um, so that's mainly through increasing number of visitors, that's where we get the bulk of our revenue from as visitors, and our membership. So we've had, a, over that five years, a 76% increase in our number of annual members. And for us, that was a very deliberate strategy because our daily visitors are so influenced by weather. And if you get bad weather, and bad weather can mean really hot or pouring with rain, if you get bad weather on a critical day, like a Sunday, public holiday, school holidays, you don't get that money back. People choose not to come and you just don't get it back. So, you know, I remember one particular January where Monato was closed for nine days out of the 31 because we closed at 40 degrees because of bushfire risk. And that's nine days with no revenue. 
but our expenditure is almost the same because we still have animals, they still need to be fed. So getting an annual membership just evens out that cash flow. We've also been able to uh, invest in infrastructure. You know, running zoos is not a cheap exercise. Obviously there's the food and the health uh, care of the animals, um, but also maintaining infrastructure. Uh, Monato is over a thousand hectares, it's got roads, it's got fences, Whenever there's a storm, a tree comes down on a fence, it's usually the newest fence, that's just the way it works. Um, so at the time I started, we were investing about $130,000 in our total capital budget across, in those days it was three sites, because it included Warrawong Sanctuary. And that was all of our maintenance, all of our vehicles, all of our IT, all of our exhibit upgrades, all of our roads, it just, wasn't sustaining. We've now increased that and we're investing close to $2 million. So the numbers are doing pretty well. But the real reason we do all of that, like that was essential and that's why the board appointed me, was to try and lead that financial turnaround. But we don't exist to make money. You know, it's a good thing to make money. And that I had to change the rhetoric of our staff. The staff thought business practices and making money and revenue was a bit the dark side. You know, I used the word entertainment in one of my very first presentations to staff and there was this audible gasp because we're a conservation organisation. We shouldn't be talking entertainment. And so trying to move away from it's not entertainment or conservation, it's entertainment and conservation. And the more we do the entertainment bit well, obviously with a real focus on animal welfare and animal ethics, but if we can introduce something that brings more people through the door and more members, we can do more conservation because that at our heart is what we are about. But people don't generally pay for it. And thank you so much for that wonderful plug, Rob, for um, work in Africa uh, to support rhino conservation because that is a species that is absolutely on the brink. And they are the most... Southern, southern white rhinos, and we lost the northern white rhino. The last male died um, not that long ago, Sudan. There is now only two female northern white rhinos left in the world. And so you could say that species is extinct. Southern white rhinos are right on the cusp. And there's an opportunity to make a difference. But to do that needs work in Africa, it needs work in Asia, it needs work in Australia. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. But thank you for, for promoting that great work. Because I tell you what, those poachers are going out there with military grade equipment. And we've got rangers going out there, um, generally straight from about year eight schooling, with bare feet, trying to protect rhinos. They're literally putting their life on the line. Uh, one of my staff was there volunteering, and uh, she left about a week before the sanctuary got attacked, and the women were raped, um, the rhinos were shot, and their horns hacked off. It is, it is a war happening there. But I'm going to talk really, really quickly on just some of the conservation work we're doing because we're doing work um, in Australia and also overseas. And a lot of this our visitors don't necessarily see because people come to the zoo for entertainment, for a lovely family day out. We've also found families, grandparents bringing children, people bringing a first date is our third highest marker. <coughs> Go figure. The things you learn when you do market research. It's a nice, safe place to bring a date because um, if you don't really like them, you can just look at the animals. And if you do like them, you can talk to them, whereas if you take them to a movie, you can't. So, you know, there we go. But a lot of our visitors don't come for the reason of conservation, but it is why we exist. This little bird, an orange-bellied parrot, is one of the most critically endangered birds in Australia. Um, it's quite a staggering bird in that it... it, it um, has a migratory path from the southern parts of Australia to Tasmania every year for the breeding season. You know, that's a bloody long way to go for a little tiny parrot. We at the zoo have been breeding orange belly parrots. Last year was our most successful and we had 19 successful hatchlings. Last year in the wild there was only 20 birds made that migratory pattern. So they are, again, absolutely on the cusp and there's a lot of really interesting ethical debates in conservation about when, does this, when is it too late? When have you left your run too late? Stop putting all your energy into a species and put it into something that's not in quite as bad a state. And that was a debate that um, the recovery team had late last year about orange belly parrots. 
And we stood firm and said, we're not giving up. We can save this bird. And my team bred 19 of them. But they also had to do some very interesting engineering to try and bring the breeding a little bit earlier so that they don't give birth in an Australian summer when it's 43 degrees for a bird that generally resides in Victoria and Tasmania. So that seemed to work. We're also doing work with a little, very cute little thing called a waru. That's the Aboriginal name. It's, it's actually a black-flanked rock wallaby. Uh, they were extinct in the northern parts of South Australia. Uh, we've just recently won an International Conservation Award for this project, so we're all very proud of this one. Um, we do breeding at Monato and release the waru back into a fenced area in the Aboriginal lands, uh, the Abri at Ananyu Pichinjara, Young Pichinjara lands, and they go into a 100 hectare site that's feral proof fenced so that the waru have had time to re establish a population and we're now releasing fully into the wild. So that is a species that has been saved, which is fabulous. This cute little guy weighs five grams, fully grown. Um, never before held in captivity, a Mali emu wren. Uh, they are now extinct in South Australia, uh, but there's a small pocket remaining in the southern parts of Victoria. It's primarily been through habitat uh, clearance as well as bushfires. They'd never been held in captivity before, and so we've received a bit of funding support from BirdLife Australia and the Murray Bridge Rotary Club, who helped us build an aviary to hold these, and if they're five grams when they're fully grown, when they're little, they're really hard to keep in an aviary. So Rotary at Murray Bridge did fundraising, but the guys actually came out on site at the back of Monato and have built aviaries. Um, and we've now just done a um, collection of some Maliemu wren, and we're trying to learn how do you keep them in captivity, how do you breed them in captivity, and then how do you release them to the wild. So we're watching this one with interest. And of course, the Tassie Devil Project is probably one of the most well-known um, projects. It's one I often talk about as being um, something about the science of zoos. So this one, we work with the University of Sydney. Every Tasmanian devil that's held by one of the, the um, captive organisations um, submits the genetics, and there is a whole team of scientists that work out which devil should breed with which devil, which one should get released where, as we try and develop a vaccine. So it's a really strong scientific project. And of course we do work with international projects as well. I've just highlighted two here. One is with the rhinos. Um, we are hoping to have a uh, rhino sanctuary. We're building it at the moment at Monato. And we're really trying to copy the Tassie Devil project and say, let's do all the work in Africa, supporting the rangers, which we do, doing education work to say that a rhino horn isn't going to cure cancer. It's just like chewing your fingernails. But in the meantime, let's bring a large number of rhinos so that we've got a genetically viable insurance population held at Monato. And that's work that's underway at the moment, not helped by um, a finding of tuberculosis in rhinos in Africa. So our rhinos have to do quarantine in Africa, travel to New Zealand, do six, uh, 12 months quarantine in New Zealand, and then travel to Monato. And if you think a dog quarantine is hard, try it with 32 tonne rhinos when you have to maintain all of the waste for 12 months. I'll just leave you with that image just for a moment. We've had a team of engineers having a look at how we do that. And then of course our giant panda project which has been uh, running at Adelaide where funds go back to China. And the good news with that one not good news, we haven't yet had a successful cub, and I'm sure I'll get a question on that. Uh, but the good news is um, at the last uh, survey of giant pandas, their numbers were estimated to have actually increased in the wild from about 1,600 to about 2,000. So still not big numbers, but at least it's moved in the right direction. As I said, when I was here three years ago, we had just launched our master plan. So I'm just going to touch on it really quickly, because this is our 20-year plan. This is what we want Adelaide and Monato zoos to look like in 20 years. And it's really nice to, to look back three years when I was here um, to say we've now opened, funded and opened two of the projects in this plan and now we're chasing money for the rest of them. Um, we've got two zoos, Adelaide Zoo, we call our city oasis. It's very small, but we're lucky that it's so close to the city and the gardens are just beautiful. Um, my horticulture team have a sort of informal competition with the Botanic Gardens horticulture team about who can have gardens that look the best. Um, and there's a drink on it between Lucy and I as the director of Botanic Gardens. Um, Adelaide Zoo has, has 
got a rich, rich history and some parts of the zoo are beautiful and have had refresh and upgrades like the panda facility. Other parts are old and they don't meet what we would say is, is good welfare requirements, things like our lions, our um, sea lions, our giraffes. And so we're continually chasing money to try and look at how can we improve and bring it all to the standard that we want. The project we're currently working on, we launched our Nature's Playground, which was hugely successful in a partnership with Variety. When now we have plans for a new children's zoo, um, we've got the designs, we've got about three quarters of the money, so you know, getting there, hoping that we'll be able to start the building of that one in February next year, if our funding is successful. At Monato, we call it our big wild place. Um, I often used to say when I was giving presentations that you can fit every zoo of Australia into Monato and have space left over. And whenever I said that, there was always a sceptic in the audience who didn't believe me because they had come from New South Wales and they knew how big the zoo at Dubbo was. So I got my very clever um, graphics people to do that and they put every, the footprint of every zoo and you'll see we've got space left over, quite a bit of it. Um, some really exciting things at Monato. We did launch last year um, our Lions 360. Has anyone had a chance to do it yet? I know there's someone who's about to. We've got someone who's done it. Um, this reverses the zoo concept, so the people are in the cage and the lions are outside. It's been fabulous for us in that it's one of our behind the scenes experiences that we can cater for larger groups of people. So it's quite profitable and we're quite open about the fact that we're doing this to be entertaining and financial. But it also means that uh, a portion of the, the profit that we make, we send back to our partners in the Zambian carnivore program. So it's actually supporting lion conservation in the wild as well as supporting our future developments. Um, and as I said, if, if you've, when you get up close and personal with a lion, you don't forget it very quickly. Um, and it's just, uh, it's exceeded our expectations. And our next big plan at Monato is our Wild Africa precinct. So this is 560 hectares that is not currently open to the public. Uh, it's alongside Monato. And we have an agreement in principle. We're just working with lawyers on contracts. So I'll be able to come back in a year and tell you all about it. Um, of a, an in, interstate developer who will be investing a large amount of his money into building accommodation at Monato, which will be uh, fabulous in allowing people to do early morning and evening safaris. It's planning on building a safari resort and really trying to mimic an African experience an hour's drive from Adelaide, which will just be fabulous. Uh, and really, again, allow us to do more conservation because it's all about uh, raising money. And part of that is, as I said, the development of our rhino sanctuary, which will be alongside Wild Africa. And we've got the big shed part way up. Robin helped us with the auction a couple of years ago. Um, it's a thousand metre shed and has to hold 10 rhinos in a quarantine area. So it's engineered to the nth degree, but it's, it's well underway. So I always finish with this slide, I told you I'd finish just before 10 to, so I can take some questions. I do always remind people that we are a conservation charity and you know the zoo did get into really serious financial trouble and I don't actually think that South Australians realised how close they came to the potential of losing the zoo completely. Uh, and there were discussions about appointing administrators, there were discussions about closing the zoo down um, because certainly the state government wouldn't take on the cost of running a zoo. And I cannot imagine a state and how, how much poorer our state would be um, without a good quality zoo. And I, I fully recognise that we need to improve a number of our facilities. But we're doing such vital conservation work and we're educating there's more than 50,000 school students a year and they're becoming passionate conservationists as well. And that, I think, is a real legacy we can leave the state. So always encourage people to do what you can. I know there's a number of life members already here. There's a zoo volunteer here. Um, but if ever you're looking for a difficult gift to buy for someone, membership's great, Lions 360 vouchers. There's a whole range of things that you can do. But on that note, I'm happy to take any questions. Questions? Do I... Hi, Elaine. Hello. Oh, Hi. Yep. Thank you so much for the talk. That was really, really uh, very insightful. Um,
question was, what, you mentioned earlier that the zoo is currently to have, uh, has 30% in renewable energies. Mm -hmm. um, is there anything in the plan that uh, intends to increase that number? And if so, to what percentage are you looking to in increase sustainable yeah, energy? Really good question. Um, we've got solar panels on every bit of roof that we currently own, so we can't go too much further until we build something new, and then we will definitely look at that. Um, battery storage, I think, is the key for us, and, and all of our discussions with partners are not quite there yet, but it's not far away for us to look at uh, battery storage and how we can, especially at Monato, where we've got so much space. Adelaide, we're limited, um, we've got such beautiful trees, it does mean we've got quite a bit of shade on, on most of our roof space, but Monato, not at all. So, yeah, we would love to, I'd love to be self-sustaining at Monato. Uh, we're working with a number of partners as well in water. So, I mean, with, with um, Power, we've got AGL and Zen as partners and, and corporate partners. Uh, water, we're working with SA Water and also a, a local company called Centec, who are doing all the really fancy, smart monitoring. If you've got a 1,500 hectare property and you have a water leak, it used to take us a while to find it. Now we've got real-time reporting. So, um, But also really focused on um, the whole thing about carbon, so we do do um, annual carbon reporting, that forces us to question about, but we didn't want to go down the route of buying carbon credits, it seemed a bit of a, we'd rather put that money into genuine conservation, we'll get as close to carbon neutral as we can, I don't think we can quite get to zero without buying, and we'd rather put that money into conservation. A great question, thank you. I'll keep changing the nice photos, because then you get pretty photos. Elaine, uh, thank you, that was a wonderful uh, discussion. Um, Two-part question, if I can. Uh, I hadn't thought about fencing until you talked about the rhinos. I, I imagine it would be extremely difficult to contain animals like that. So I wonder if you can just talk about how they are contained. And secondly, uh, second part question, uh, I talked earlier about uh, native extinction in Australia. Yeah. I wonder could you just touch on that and what we're seeing in terms of this, uh, you know, extinction in Australia? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, containment is always an interesting thing. And zoos around the world are now unfortunately, sadly, just as focused on keeping people out as well as animals in, so it's got to be a two-way street. So Wild Africa is a, as an example. It's 560 hectares. It's, we've just completed the perimeter fencing, which is more about the keeping people out. Um, we now have to feral-proof that, so it has a, a cat um, overhang and a rep, and I mean ferals in feral animals. Um, <laughs> can be both. Uh, it keeps rabbits out and, and cats out, so um, that's a big piece of work. I've currently got two staff members and the rest are a team of volunteers, 560 hectares. Uh, but we also um, have got a, an arrangement with the army and we have the army for two days every six months. There's a bit of team building for them. They're fabulous at building fences. Um, and then there's the internal area, which has to be steel. Um, so we, we've got about 19 kilometres that we need to um, fence. We've got two kilometres um, under sponsorship with Australian National Rail, so we've told them any time they rip up railroad track, we'd love to have it, um, because we don't care if it's old steel. And the rest is it's chasing all of the time. Then we have to have antelope-proof fences. They can leap three metres high, so you've also got electric grids. and so It's a myriad of fencing, all of which is expensive and time-consuming. So if anyone knows anyone in the steel industry who would like to support us, we'd really, really like to hear from them. Uh, Australia, we have written to her, believe me, we don't miss those opportunities, haven't had a response yet. Um, as far as Australian natives, look, you know, we often look in um, at the big ambassador creatures like cheetah, giraffe, um, rhinos, lions, etc. But Australia has got one of the worst records of, of mammal extinctions in the world. And then when you look at amphibians and birds, it's even worse. The, the vast majority is through the introduction of, of predator pest species. So foxes and cats, uh, a single biggest thing we could do is have better legislation about our predators. Register. I own a cat because my daughter's a cat lover. I'm the dog person in the family. Um, but, you know, keeping them inside at night. And that's the sort of thing we educate um, our school children about. All for having a pet, but look after them because they do significant damage. We work with um, Adelaide Uni have just got this fabulous new... Um, I don't know how you describe it. It shoots out a poison, but it, it actually... It's like facial recognition technology. It knows what's walking past it. So we're talking not in suburbia, Adelaide. 
um, but in areas where you, if we've reintroduced wallabies, we've reintroduced spotted quolls, we don't want to go through all that effort and then just see them get killed by a feral cat or a fox. So this little piece of technology can test what's walking past. It leaves all of the native animals alone. It shoots a little poison out, but a feral cat, being a cat, licks it off and quietly and peacefully passes away. So it's been approved. We've been working with the RSPCA. It is much better than baits, which you don't know who's going to pick up. It's much better than traps, which from a welfare point of view... So there's a whole range of things we can do, but I think controlling, um, clearance, but particularly foxes and cats, is the single biggest thing we could do. Elaine, uh, great presentation and a fantastic job. Um, we talked about, or you, you touched on uh, some of the causes of native animal extinction, which is usually, you know, human enroachment. Yep. But with rhinoceros, it's about how, how are we fixing the demand for the rhinoceros product, which drives this whole escapade? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's such a complex question. <laughs> and I know I don't have a long time to give a complex answer. I mean, rhino horn is made from keratin. So it's, if you look at it, it's just like really matted hair. But it sells currently in the black market for more than gold or cocaine. And it's sold and the demand is coming from really now two sources. One is traditional medicines. And it's, you know, it's hard to argue that um, traditional medicines have been around for a long, long time. And it's viewed as having magical powers. It will reduce fever, all sorts of other things. And it's mainly China and Vietnam, but not solely now. We we'll say, well, why don't you farm rhinos? You know, we, it's, we don't want to be seen that we're going in and preaching to other cultures because we kill a lot of animals too. And we generally then enjoy them for lunch. Um, so they're saying, well, a simple answer would be farm rhinos. You can chop a rhino's horn off. Um, it's, it is. It's like cutting your fingernails. So there's a lot of places in Africa now are debating about whether you should have rhino farms and actually farm the horn. Ethically, I find it really challenging to, to have that debate, but I can understand that side of the argument. Um, America is becoming a growing market for it, and that's not so much because of the belief in traditional medicine, but more a status symbol, which is pretty horrible to think about. You know, I, I've got the horn from the last northern white rhino that ever lived on the earth. How do, you, how do you combat that? I think a lot of the answer has to be around education, um, as it is generally the way with the world. It's also about addressing poverty. Um, a lot of the people who are killing the rhinos um, are given money by where the big money is going. And these are people who have very, very little to support their own families. So if someone offers them a, a, a small amount of money to go and shoot a rhino, it's a huge amount of money for them. So what can we do to bring those families out of poverty? We're doing that. We do things like selling these little beads, which is our rhino fundraiser, uh, and the money goes back into local communities. So the aim is you make the wildlife, and tourism can play a big part in this, make the wildlife more valuable alive than it is dead while you educate. But all of those things are long-term solutions, and I'm not, we're not convinced that they'll work quickly enough. Hence the reason to set up a genetically viable population. Sorry, I know that was a long answer, but there's a little western swamp tortoise, one of the world's cutest little things, uh, critically endangered in Western Australia, and only Adelaide and Perth zoos are breeding them. Just um, oh, one quick question. Quick answer. <laughs> quick answer, um, sorry. I've got to put a bit of humour into this. As a former auditor of the Royal uh, Zoological Society, one of the stories was... Uh, that when you, sometimes these pro bono jobs were where you put the juniors because you had nothing else to do and you wanted to make them feel a bit useful. So uh, on one occasion, one of the seniors had an audit junior with him and he said, well, listen, can you go and do a stock take? So he's wandered around the zoo, beautifully counting everything. Had a real problem with the guinea pig area, apparently, but uh, <laughs> the, uh, little did he know that the animals in the zoo are not sitting on the balance sheet, but anyway, that's another story. I was just going to mention very briefly there's a really excellent article in the Weekend magazine a couple of weeks ago about the Australian Wildlife Conservancy and what they're doing. And I think yep. they have a hugely relevant role in addition to our zoological gardens and certainly this one here in South Australia, which is fantastic. A good friend of mine was a former um, manager of the Monato Zoo and then he moved to the top of Cape York. So we went through Lakefield Conservation Park. I just want to share with you what we don't do in this country with our own native fauna and flora. 
Uh, that area is 5,370 square kilometres. I know that because I just Googled that. Um, put in acres, that's what over a million acres. I think there are three ranges on that property and the money that we put towards that is about $4 a hectare. It's just so minimal. And of course they can't do anything. So uh, we went to the top of Cape York and back and I know Simon Drew's about to do that with a good friend of mine shortly, a good friend of his obviously. And uh, my comment coming back was, I did a thing for our, our group. We have wild pigs. They are hugely a problem in Cape York, but they're a big problem in a lot of regions straight. Goats, cats, dingoes, and then dingoes breed with wild dogs. Uh, and then we go into their bird population brought in from Europe. The fact is that we have created an ecological disaster in this country, and we're not doing enough about it, in my opinion. We're not spending enough money in the right places. I, I think I salute what you're doing at Monato and what we're doing in our zoos just to educate people. That's a really big part of it. We need to educate our politicians as well to prioritise our own fauna and flora. And they don't get the message at the moment. When they go on a holiday, they go to the airport and go overseas. They should go through the back box of Australia and see what this country has and how it's being denigrated. And going to an area like Cape York, and I'll just share this with you, the national parks and uh, Aboriginal parks in the Cape York area are bigger than the size of France. That gives you a sense of how big this country is and how little we are doing is as exemplified by that poor contribution per hectare. So I'll just leave that with you. Thank you again and salute the zoo. Uh, and, and look, we do work with the Australian Wildlife Conservancy. We actually have one of their staff permanently based with us. They're doing some fabulous work. Could not agree more. If you look at the percentage spend of both the Commonwealth and the state budgets uh, on the environment, it has been going down every year for about the last 15 years and we need to reverse that if we want to make a difference. So lobbying all you can, and I'm not having a go at either side because it's happened with both Labor and Liberal that we need to commit more to protect what we've got because it's pretty fabulous stuff. There, thank you. Um, there's a wonderful article that Elaine has been involved with, which is in the mentoring side and I'll give it to Paul, he may be able, he'll distribute it to everybody, but I actually think it's quite inspirational and will give you a great insight into a chief executive who's taken over a basket case and has made something very, very special. I mean, Elaine clearly enjoys what she does and she's incredibly passionate and there's a statement she's made in the article which says, leaders leave a legacy every day. And I suggest to you we've seen a great leader today and please raise and thank her for a great presentation. <laughs>